All right. Um, we're getting ready to start the next session. And if you haven't had a chance to uh, try some of the cookies and coffee or sodas, please do so. If you don't, I'll have to take all those cookies home myself. <laughs> uh, it would give me a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker has, has been involved with uh, the DC Community Alliance uh, since we started it up this year. Um, her, uh, Robin and her husband Lee and have helped out uh, Andrew on the lines quite a bit in different ways, and we're lucky to have uh, Robin here today. Uh, Robin is the clinical director and lead therapist at Greco Associates. Her practice is in Old Town, Alexandria. Uh, Robin and her counselors serve individual adolescents, adults, couples, families, and groups. They are dedicated to helping their patients make and maintain positive changes in their lives, bring a positive, proactive approach to therapy, helping patients achieve greater self-esteem, build healthier relationships, and make the emotional, cognitive, and behavioral changes they seek. So let's welcome Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robin Burkell. Some of you know me as Robin Margulies. Um, my husband, Lee, has a cavernoma. I'm also a licensed therapist in one practice in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm a trauma therapist. So when my husband got diagnosed with this, I thought, oh, wow, here we go, my own trauma. <laughs> Today is the first day that I'm presenting after listening to all of your stories and information. And so my heart is just full as well as working on my own regulation today because all of this is so big um, for everybody. So I'm going to talk about self-care and the importance of that. And of course, as a therapist, I think that that is the most important thing because I think the brain and the body work together. Um, and your mental health really matters, both for the patient as well as the person doing the caregiving. And I think that that is so important and I'm going to talk about it. You might have noticed in uh, while, while we we're on break, but there's a song playing. It's a song by uh, a group called Imagine Dragons. It's called Polaroid, and it's really about if you listen to the lyrics, and at the end, if you're interested, I can put them back up. Um, it really is about running yourself ragged and why it is so important to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm going to talk about self care. <clears throat> what is self care? You know, most of us think about self care as far as like physical stuff. What do we need to do to take care of the patient in our life? What do we need to do to help them feel better? Well, here I'm going to talk about this from a different perspective. I'm going to talk about it from the idea of your mental health. And that it is so important that the caregiver also be taking care of the mental health. Because you're taking care of that person in your life. It is so important, obviously, for the patient to you know, work on ways in which they can feel good about themselves, have compassion, etc. I'm going to talk about this from the standpoint of everybody in this room is awesome. We should all have compassion for everybody in this room and yourselves. That is so important. Most people have this very large inner critic. I'm not doing this well enough. I'm, I should be doing this better. What else can I do? Let me think about it. I want you to just think about what's awesome about you, what I'm good at, like what matters. Really, each and every one of you, we need to grow some self-compassion. It becomes so important as you prioritize your physical and mental health. You know, self-care includes all of these things that are on the screen, you know, including watching your favorite movie, wrapping yourself in a blanket, putting on your fuzzy slippers. I wrote an article for my blog around why I wear my fuzzy slippers at night. Like, these are really important things. Like, are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating well? Are you saying no when you need to? I have not been so good at that in the last couple of weeks. This is my third presentation in three weeks. Um, I'm going to get back on my own plan. Um, it's really important. Are you doing? You know, are you doing yoga? Are you doing meditation? Are you doing mindful? Excuse me, mindfulness. Are you giving yourself access to your support system? And who is your support system? Are you exercising, going for a walk? Can you bake? Can you laugh? Can you watch a YouTube video and just laugh? Just giving yourself a moment to calm your nervous system. What are the benefits? 
Self-care is not selfish. It is not self-indulgent. We cannot nurture others from a dry well. We need to take care of our own needs first, and then and then we then we can give from our surplus our abundance. It's so important. We have to have to take care of ourselves. This is a really great book. It's mostly dedicated to women, but this self-nurturing guide is it's small, it's fabulous, it's got a few things you can do anywhere. Why is caretaking for yourself emotionally important and what is it? You can't see it from the outside. Nobody knows if you're doing it or not. But you need to treat yourself with compassion and curiosity. Like, why am I doing that? And why does it make sense? In the world of trauma treatment, we talk about um, why people do things. And it's not because they're bad. It's not because they're wrong. It just makes sense given their history. And so for each of you, just to think about giving yourself some compassion that what you do is making sense. Why you're doing it is making sense. Noticing your emotions. It's kind of a gentle awareness. Are you paying attention? How am I feeling right now? You know, like when I stepped up here and I said, oh, I'm feeling weirdly anxious for me to stand up in front of a room because all of you are in my own personal world and matter. Making sure your emotional support system is there where you can be there for yourself. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about living with a loved one's illness and how that can be traumatic. Trauma triggers an overwhelming sense of feeling unsafe or insecure. And I will try not to cry while I talk about it. I never know what's going to happen. I never know. You know, it's traumatic. It, just, it distorts a person's ability to maintain an inner sense of well-being. Right? Like, how can I remain calm? How can I stay regulated? It can come from your any experience that overwhelms your sense of being safe, your sense of being okay with yourself, with your relationship, with the people you love. You know, and also if you have a history of trauma in your life, so starting in childhood, trauma before the age of 27, before the brain fully develops from a mental health perspective, is huge. It impacts us greatly and needs to get addressed. Everyone in this room, in my opinion, has experienced some trauma. Some of you way before 27. And so how are you taking care of yourself? What are you doing about that? How are you giving yourself permission to get help? Empathy is a double-edged sword. It is simultaneously your greatest asset can a point of real vulnerability. I love these quotes. The very act of being compassionate and empathetic extracts a cost under most circumstances. Think about that. You know, we feel each other's pain. It is awesome to be able to be that sensitive to another person, to love another person that much. And to be worried about, so for the patients, to be worried about their caregivers. It goes back and forth. The act of being compassionate and empathetic is, has a cost. If we don't keep it regulated, and I have a slide later about affect regulation, so what it's like to regulate your emotions, then you know it drains us. For those who are caregivers, um, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is unrealistic, as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. I think that is so important. Everybody in this room is impacted, and I cannot say that enough. My mental health, taking care of it, is, for me, of the utmost importance. It has to be up there with the physical health because they impact each other. I really love the self-care wheel. Um, and if any of you are interested, I'm happy to send you, excuse me, send you these slides. It really talks about all of the things that are so important in taking care of yourself. Physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, personal, and professional. A lot of people in this room, like myself, have jobs. I go to work every day and hear about everybody else's horrors. What about my own? How do you all take care of your own? Is there a therapist in your life that you can go to, that you can take care, that can help take care of your emotions? How do you do that? It's so important. So how do you regulate your emotions? What do you do about it? 
Does anybody have any great ideas that you can think of for yourself? Exercise and massage therapy, yeah. So important. Eating well, exercising, getting enough sleep, being with people who love you, comfort, um, both clothing, some people, as long as your food, comfort foods are not too much that it's going into that you're using food to regulate your emotions. You know, the idea is to have a balance, to have a lot of different things within your support system that you can use excuse me, to be able to take care of your emotions, to slow them down. Meditation, mindfulness, you know, there's a, a ton of apps out there that are on your phone that you go to whenever you want. And some of the meditations on there are two minutes long. Everybody's got two minutes. You're sitting in a doctor's office. You've got two minutes while you're waiting. You probably have 20. <laughs> right? Like, there's a lot of things that you can do to calm your own nervous system. And they're really important. This quote is written by a trauma survivor, and all the quotes in here I, I love, so I just kind of included them. Even in times of trauma, we can try to maintain a sense of normality until we no longer can. That, my friends, is called surviving, not healing. We never become whole again. We are survivors. If you are here today, you are a survivor. But those of us who made it through hell and are still standing, we bear a different name. Warriors. They're all warriors. Really important to not just keep going and white knuckle it. We've got to get through it and figure out how to be better on the other side. And it's hard. You are all warriors, not just survivors. Because you're here. Some warriors adaptive. Anxiety is a natural response to protect one's baby. And often that's expressed with hyper alertness and hyper vigilance. Right? Trauma survivors, each of you probably have some hyper awareness, hyper arousal, hyper vigilance. Who are they okay? Are they not okay? What's going on? Is that a symptom? I know I say that to you all the time. Is that a moment? Is, is that happening? Paying attention to that. And some of it's adaptive, right? It helps us. It helps us be more aware. We're more aware than some of these doctors because we pay more attention. We are hyper aroused. Some of it is adaptive. Too much of it throws you into not being able to be present in your own life, not being able to be present in the joy of your life. So you probably all have heard about fight, flight, freeze at some point if you've watched National Geographic, right? When you have trauma, you, your body responds in fight, flight, freeze, right? It's like the woman who got into a car accident and her kids were still stuck in the car and you read about her and she could lift up the car. She had so much adrenaline. We all can do lots of things when we're in that moment of fight, flight, freeze. How do we get out of it? And how do we figure out how not to stay in fight, flight, freeze? Because fight, flight, freeze means that your cortisol levels are higher. Your adrenaline is higher. Your body is sending many more chemicals through it than you need to be present every day. And the more and more we send those chemicals through, the more and more our body gets used to it. And so that's kind of scary because the more times you are in this fight, flight, freeze, unfortunately, you are causing harm to your own body. Here's why I'm talking about self-care, because it's important. We all want to be here as long as humanly possible, both patients and caregivers. We need to be able to find ways to take care of our lives, take care of our, our bodies, so that we can be here. It's so important. Here's a slide I was talking about. Some people go into what's called hypoarousal. Um, basically, it's that numb feeling, detached, flat affect, kind of withdrawn, avoidant. Some people cope with trauma by going numb. You know, they pull up under the blankets at home and don't talk to anybody. They avoid their friends. They're disconnected. They don't feel alive. Lots of people go into hyperarousal. I think most people in this room are in hyperarousal because you want to get as much knowledge as humanly possible. You are trying really hard to be as informed as you can, which is awesome. We need to make sure that it stays within this window of tolerance. So the ability to think and feel at the same time. That's huge. When you really think about it, 
When you're experiencing that fight, flight, freeze, you cannot think and feel at the same time. You are either feeling or you're in autopilot and you are thinking. It doesn't both happen at the same time unless you have ways of regulating yourself. You have to find ways to do that. Ironically, one of the easiest ways to regulate your emotions is take a sip of water. It actually activates the salivary gland in your brain, brings back your prefrontal cortex online, and gets you back in the present tense. Really easy. Nobody is going to question you taking a sip of water anywhere. So if you're embarrassed, if you're anxious, and you don't know how to handle it, water. I mean, it's really not, not, that, not that hard if you're interested and you're aware. Um, our bodies are constantly giving us vital information about our physical and emotional well-being. Yet trauma survivors work hard to disavow and disconnect from our bodies, shutting down sensations that feel overwhelming or re-triggering, and in the process, lose the body as a compass or guide. Right? How many of you, excuse me, how many of you sometimes don't listen to your own bodies? Right? And do you know what's going on with you? Do you know you're tired? Do you know you're exhausted? Do you know you're working too much? Right? We have to start paying attention to our body. And for a lot of trauma survivors, especially early trauma survivors who had trauma to their bodies, so medical trauma, physical trauma, sexual trauma, etc., they kind of cut themselves off here. I don't feel anything else below here. You know, for all of you who are patients, it's really important to feel the body, to know it, to be able to understand what's going on in that window of tolerance, right? Because otherwise, every little ache or pain feels like something big. So again, the importance of being able to remain regulated, remain consciously aware. Like, of course I'm scared. Ooh, this hurts. It makes sense. I have a cavernoma. Oh my gosh. My husband forgot a word. Of course I'm scared. He has a cavernoma. It makes sense. I'm okay. I'm not crazy. None of you are either. I'm going to show you a quick video. I hope it's right. Um, I really love it. I, I stole it from a training that I went to. Um, it really talks about, especially for men, this concept of man up. Why you just shouldn't suck it up. I think it's really important information. Um, if any of you are offended by language, within the first couple of seconds, there is a swear word. Um, I couldn't take it out, but I think, I hope you'll enjoy it. Okay. Ten responses to the phrase, man up. One, watch me. <laughs> Two, if you want to, Question my masculinity, like a school yard circle of curses, like a sword fight with lightsaber and action and save your breath. Because contrary to what you may believe, not every problem can be solved by rolling in there. You cannot all wrestle your way out of chemical depression. The CEO of the company that just made you all does not care how much you bench. And I promise there is no light here in the universe or body that don't make you love yourself. <laughs> Oh man, oh yeah, yeah, that's that new superhero, right? Mild man and token salesman, Mark Man Swans, the magic boys, man up in the trans pool. This is the five o'clock shadow. The massive muscle, deep voice, and the dust around you, Superman, who prevents the world from how it feels. Four, <laughs> of course, why fight to remove our chains when we can simply compare their legs? Why step outside the box when the box has this badass plane decal kind of thing? I see the rats, dangerous and poisonous and stupid. Why? Do you ever notice how nobody ever says women up? They just get quiet. Because women and the women's movement for not a long time for that being directly explicitly ordered around by commercial babies and who think is dehumanizing. When will men figure that out? Six, the phrase man up suggests that confidence and perseverance are uniquely masculine traits. That women, not to mention any man who doesn't eat steak, drive a big truck, and have a lot of sex with women are nothing, but be more than background characters, comic relief, props, more than anything else. It suggests that to be yourself, whether you wear skinny jeans, or rock and roll eyeliner, or drink some other brand of light beer or white poetry. 
for the cost of me. Seven. How many boys have to kill themselves for this country of knowledge is the bottom? How many women have to be assaulted? How many trans people have to be murdered? We teach boys how to wear the skin of a man, but we also teach them how to raise that skin like a flag and draw blood for them. Boys get blue socks. Girl, babies get blue socks. What about what about foreigners? What about green? What about saloon? Black, high dye, buffalo, black, rainbow, eye, nine. I want to be free to express myself. Man up. I want to have meaningful emotional relationships with my brothers. Man up. I want to be weak sometimes. Man up. I want to be strong in a way that isn't about physical power or dominance. Man up. I want to talk to my son about something other than sports. Man up. I want to be who I am. Man up. Ten. I saw that. I thought it was fabulous. The idea of taking care of yourself emotionally, being able to talk about your emotions, especially for a guy with tattoos and really tough, etc. And he talks about this. If you look at the YouTube videos, you can see a little bit more information about him. And he talks about why can't we talk about emotions? Why is that not cool? Why is that not okay? Why can't we talk about our feelings? Why can't we talk about how hard life is, what we struggle about? And so I think that that leads to kind of why I think that you need to have kindness and compassion to yourself, learning to respond in that way. Not what is wrong with me, but why does this make sense in my life? You know, really understanding. Kristen Knapp writes a phenomenal book, and she's got some YouTube videos and TED Talks as well. She wrote this book called Self-Compassion, um, and she is the mom of a child with disabilities, a single mom. And she writes about it, and she talks about it, and it's fabulous. She talks about self-compassion is not a valuation of self-worth. It's just a way of treating yourself kindly, whether things are good or things are bad. You can motivate yourself not out of fear of being inadequate, but because you care about yourself. Can you give the same comments to yourself that you give to your best friend? Can you say it's okay? Can you say you're doing the best you can? Can you just understand that this is hard and you can deserve compassion and kindness? Linda Graham writes a book called The Neuroscience of Resilience and Wellbeing, and she talks about sort of how it functions in the brain. And these are her six C's of coping. The things that really provide help to you as you're doing healthy coping. If you notice, calm, compassion, clarity, connections, confidence, and courage. As a therapist, I know that connection is the key to life. It's the key to happiness. It's joy. We all need connections in our life. We all need people. And so it's fabulous we're all here and being able to connect with each other. Connections are an antidepressant, a natural one. It's really important to keep them going. And from my view, everybody who is working to take care of themselves and others are courageous. Give yourself a little bit of compassion. I think you're all awesome. Self-care is not selfish. I have to say that over and over and over again. Not just today, but in every day that I go to work. You deserve it. You really do. This is not a big deal to be able to take care of yourself. It is not selfish. You know, sort of that, that comment on, on when you're on the airplane about putting the oxygen mask on yourself before others. If you remember that quote I showed a few slides ago about you can't take from a dry well. You've got to be able to take care of yourselves, all of you, because you can't give back to anyone else. You can't give back to all of us. You can't give back to the person you're caregiving, to your partners, to your children, etc. We need to be able to think kindly about ourselves. Now, listen, I know self-care is devalued. Pretty much I was told that yesterday a bunch of times, like, forget it. I don't matter. 
just only the person in my life who has a cavernola. We all want to look like we have it together, right? Like we handle it all the time, everything's great. We've been taught that self-care, especially if you live in this area or other urban areas, like self-care takes a backseat to drive and ambition. Those are the only things that are important. How many hours do you work? In the DC area, you get like a, a pin of approval if you say, I can function on only four hours of sleep. Really? That does not take care of me whatsoever. You know, like I said, there's an assumed obligation that you are going to say yes, that you should, that you're supposed to. You don't need to. You know, are you able to know that you deserve your time? You deserve that kindness. Excuse me. Are you overdue for self-care? Do any of you fit in any of these categories? Right? Like, these are signs that you need to take care of yourself. You know, you're just surviving. You're not providing yourself compassion. You're not providing yourself an avenue for healing. You know, clearly I'm a proponent for mental health. I'm standing up here. I'm a therapist. I do this all the time. And it works. I wouldn't be doing it. I've been doing it for 20 plus years. I see 30 plus clients a week who are all trauma survivors, complex trauma survivors. I'm still here. The only way I'm still here and the only way I can keep doing my job, because in my field, burnout is huge. The only way I can keep doing it is by doing self-care. So, you know, I can see myself in the last month or so in this home. We've worked 70 or 80 hour a week. I've been doing that. This has got to change. You know, you get recurring colds. You're missing out on something you want to do. You shortchange your own sleep. I've done that, has anyone else? You know, like we've got to be able to do this. You've got to be able to use a support system and build a support system, right? I hope that everyone in here has at least one other person in their life who they can depend on, who gets it, who understands. And they don't have to be in your same scenario to get it. They just have to understand your pain. I don't have to go through everything that my clients go through in order to understand it and be there for them. I just have to understand that they're all in emotional pain. And here, kind of a feeling of powerlessness sometimes. Like, what are we doing next? I can understand that. I'm guessing most people can. You know, can you call a friend? I hope that you all have one. If you don't, call me. Like, realistically, find someone. There's somebody in this room who will communicate with you. There's a whole set of Facebook pages of people <laughs> talking to each other to get support. You know, if you have children, can you trade off childcare? What can you do to be able to give yourself a few minutes of your own time? Whether that's going for a walk, whether that's getting your nails done, whether that's playing with your dog or cat, whether it's listening to a funny video, a song, something. Giving yourself some time. We all have two minute chunks at some point. I know we do. So professionals need to be a part of your support system. You know, going to the doctor and not just for the patient with the cavernoma. Karen's not here, but she talked yesterday about when um, her family member was first diagnosed, she didn't go to the doctor for three years. That's common. Most people who walk into my office don't go to the doctor. They're either scared of doctors, they don't want to know what's wrong with them, or they're too busy taking care of the patient in life. You need to take care of yourselves, too, and patients need to go, even if you're scared, even if you're scared of what you'll hear. We need to be able to find doctors who care, but also being able to realize that we need that. Getting your annual physical, that is self-care. Taking care of your mental health is part of healthy, good self-care. If anyone in this room is looking for a therapist, talk to me. I have connections all over the place. I will help you find one. I really do believe, you know, granted, this is what I do for a living, but I really do believe it works. I've been to therapy, too. I understand that. It works, and you need someone to help guide you through what do you do when you're feeling so dysregulated, when you're feeling so anxious, when you're feeling so powerless. So important. You know, I can't say it enough. Making time for you. You know, if... Housework is overwhelming. Can you give up Starbucks and get a cleaning person? You know, what can you do as 
having self-compassion in your chosen mindset, taking care of you, being mindful in the way you deal with um, daily stress. You know, for example, like I said, I have on the slide, you can calm yourself whenever you need by learning how to belly breathe. There's a phenomenal video on YouTube if you Google Sesame Street, Elmo, and belly breathing. <laughs> I would have put it on here, but my husband said I already had too many slides. It is, it is fabulous, and it talks to you about getting the breath into your belly and why that's so important. Trauma survivors breathe from up here. They breathe from their chest. They breathe, breathe shallowly. It doesn't help calm your nervous system. You've got to get that breath all the way in. So whether it's yoga, whether it's mindfulness, whether it's Elmo and YouTube, try it out. Lay on the ground, put something on your stomach, and watch it move up and down. And for some of you, you will notice that's really hard. And then you will notice that you're not actually breathing enough to take care of yourself. You've got to do this. You know, creating your own self-caring rituals. I don't care what they are. Figure them out for yourself. In the article that I'm talking about, and you can find it, my website is on the top corner over here, propellinassociates.com, or all the articles I write. Um, I taught, there's, I have several on self-care. You know, finding what your ritual is, going outside, going for a walk, sitting in your living room in your favorite chair, doing something that feels good to you. You know, meditation. For some people, it's even sleep. We just have to watch that that doesn't lead into depression, too, right? Too much sleep can be that hypo arousal, that numbing out, and that um, kind of wanting to not exist. What's the upside of self care? I think I keep talking about that. When you take good care of yourself, you feel better and you function better. For everybody in this room, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a neurologist, but I will tell you that if you take care of yourself, you will feel better. To prioritize rest and health and your emotional support, to notice life along the way, to be able to do that is brings joy in the smallest of moments. If you think about it, being able to meet your own needs for love and respect and support it makes you able, makes you more able to offer those to others. So I really like this quote, even though it has bullets next to <laughs> um, May you be moved by passion and enthusiasm for your work. May you believe, may you deeply believe that you deserve self-care. May you replenish yourself daily. May inspiration be a guiding compass to your days. May you know you are a bright light in a world that needs your presence. May you be an instrument of help and healing. And may your cup overflow so that there's plenty to share. Keep that somewhere. Hang on to it. It's really important. I'm a big quote person and allows me to talk about lots of other things so I put up a quote. You know, we all know Mr. Rogers, I imagine. <laughs> if only you could sense how important you are to the lives of those you meet, how important you can be to people you may never even dream of. There is something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with, with another person. You are important. You're important to everyone in this room. You're important to everyone in your life. We have to believe that even the briefest of human connections can heal. Otherwise, life is unbearable. I wish you all amazing self-care and compassion and remembering what is awesome about you and that whatever pain you may have, whatever you do to try and manage that pain, it makes sense. It's not wrong. You might need a little bit of help, and there's no shame in that. Take care of yourselves and each other. Thank you. Does anyone have anything? Yeah. Yeah. yeah.